Good day. There continues to be much speculation in the West about a possible war between Russia and Ukraine this winter. And in fact, as I'm making this video, there's just been a further warning from Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, warning the Ukrainians not to repeat the mistake made by the former Georgian President Mikhail Saakashvili, who launched a military offensive to try to... Uh, defeat the um, forces, the independence forces in the Georgian breakaway republic of South Ossetia, only to meet an overwhelming response from the Russian military, which eventually resulted in Georgia's defeat and which set in train a sequence of events which forced him first from power, then into exile, and which has now ended up bringing him into a Polish uh, into a Georgian prison. Um, so there's been much talk about a war, but again, as um, Lavrov has in a sense effectively said, it would be a war which the Russians are signaling clearly. It would have to be Ukraine which would start. Now, I'm going to discuss what might happen over the course of this war with reference to two articles which have recently appeared looking at this very situation and trying to game plan the scenarios and to look at them, um, look at what might happen in the, world, in the way that such a conflict uh, were to take place. And both of them are written um, from a perspective that a war would be an absolute calamity and a disaster and the writers of both of these articles obviously and very strongly oppose any such idea of such a war. One of the articles is written by a man called Ivan Timofeyev. He is a Russian analyst. He is part of the Valdai conference uh, uh, panel. Uh, he's one of their resident experts. He is, in other words, a Russian. But it's probably fair to say that he is one of those Russians who still hankers after a better, for a better relationship between Russia and the West. And the other is the most insightful of Western commentators about Russian affairs, about Russian foreign policy, especially Anatole Levin, who has written again a further article on the uh, on responsible uh, statecraft, which is the website of the Quincy Institute, which is a um, th think tank in the United States, which supports a realist approach to US foreign policy. And these articles are quite interesting because there's significant overlaps in their thinking, perhaps not entirely surprising. Uh, Levin is a regular guest to uh, panels and conferences held by the Valdai Conference, of which, as I said, Timofeyev himself is a panellist. And so it's perhaps not entirely surprising that there's a significant overlap in thinking. But also there are differences, and there are differences which are both complementary and enlightening, and which give me an opportunity to give my own views. Because, as will become very clear, there are many points where I agree with the analysis of Timofeyev and of Levin, and there are some points where I actually disagree. And I think that they're perhaps less fully informed about the situation, um, uh, about the totality of the situation, than perhaps they themselves realise. Now, the first point to say is that um, both um, that uh, Timofeyev clearly envisages the situation of the sort that has been outlined in the West, where it is Russia which attacks Ukraine without any obvious cause or provocation. And the entire purpose of his article is to explain why the Russians wouldn't do such a thing and why doing so would be contrary to Russia's interests. I, I have to say that, to my mind, this is a refutation 
of a straw man, or if you like, a straw man arg argument. Because I know of no Russian official or commentator who actually envisages any situation where Russia would launch an unprovoked attack on Ukraine. I say that because, of course, the Russians are perfectly well aware that though they would win such a war, the international reaction, including from their great ally and friend, China, to a war launched in that kind of way would be a, one of absolute horror. And Russia would, in that case, find itself severely isolated and under enormous pressure, and it would be extremely difficult and embarrassing for Russia, and that's putting it mildly. I would also add, by the way, from my own experiences in Russia, that that sort of launch of an aggressive war by Russia against Ukraine would receive an extremely hostile reaction from Russian public opinion. Russians will defend their country and will defend their red lines, their nation's red lines, and will act in order to protect the security of their country. But they are not a people at all who look for fights uh, without unprovoked fights and who will pick a fight, especially with a country like Ukraine, in that sort of way. So, as I said, I think this is a straw man argument. But nonetheless, let's, let's press on and look at Timofeyev's articles. And the first thing he says is that if there were a war, the uh, Russians would win and they would win conclusively. And he speaks about a sudden and decisive blow in several directions at once. Russian troops dismember the armed forces of Ukraine in the east of the country, surround separate groups and press them against the Dnieper River. Uh, the actions of tank and motorized units are accompanied by powerful air, missile and artillery strikes. The Russian air aerospace forces cease air supremacy. Now, I think that is essentially an accurate description of what would happen in the event that there was a war, a war which I would reiterate would only take place following a Ukrainian offensive in eastern Ukraine against the Donbass. I'm fairly certain that there would be a rapid Ukrainian military collapse. Um, in fairness, Levin takes... Um, a somewhat different different view. He he uh, predicts that in the event of the war, uh, of war the, Ukra the Ukrainian armed forces would very likely inflict serious losses on their Russian adversaries. They're much better equipped and trained than in 2014, and key units are strongly imbued with bitterly anti-Russian nationalism. How um, I have already explained in a recent uh, video that I have done why, despite these improvements in the Ukrainian military, um, the realities are that the actual military balance, both between Ukraine and the militias in the Donbass, and even more between the Ukrainian armed forces and the Russian armed forces, has actually, in my opinion, shifted radically further against Ukraine than was the case in 2014. And I would add that even Levin accepts that there would be a uh, total Ukrainian defeat. The Russian army outnumbers the Ukrainians by more than four to one, much more if Russia mobilizes its reserves, and Russia, Russian combat aircraft outnumber the Ukrainians by more than 10 to one. Uh, that's actually an understatement. Ukraine no longer has, to all intents and purposes, a functioning air force. Russia has approximately 2,900 tanks to Ukraine's 800, and more than 400 of the Russian tanks are significantly modernised T-90s. Russia also has more than 10,000 mo mothballed tanks, though how many of these are actually serviceable is not known. Anyway, even Levin accepts, uh, he thinks that the Ukrainians would put up a fight for themselves, but even he accepts that in the event of a war, Ukraine would decisively lose. 
I am wholly with Timofeyev about this. Anyway, Timofeyev then goes, I think, altogether too far, because he then speaks about how the apotheosis of the operation would be the encirclement and subsequent capture of Kiev and the stabilisation of the front line along the Dnieper. The creation of a new Ukrainian state with a capital in Dnieper in Kiev would be announced and recognised by Russia. It would include the previously independent Donbass republics. Russia would thereby resolve several historical problems at once. The immediate threat to the southwest borders would be removed. Full control of the Sea of Azov and a land corridor to a Republic of Crimea would be ensured. Two Ukrainian states appear on the map, one of which would be friendly and fraternal. Well, that's a possible uh, uh, approach. I don't personally think that is what the Russians would do. I doubt that they would actually take Kiev and try and install uh, a government of their own in Ukraine, in Kiev. I think much more likely they would take all of the territories east of the Dnieper, of the Dniester River, Dnieper River. They would they would try to incorporate. They would they would look after places, obviously in the Donbass, perhaps Kharkov and Odessa. I think that is highly likely, but I don't think that their plan would be to venture further west. I would say that whatever rump Ukrainian state was left in, in control of Kiev and in Ukraine's western regions would find itself in deep crisis and extremely vulnerable in that kind of situation. I think that cut off from the sea with its industrial base lost, I wonder whether that kind of Ukrainian state which would be admittedly culturally more coherent, would be economically or politically viable. And of course, the psychological effect on Ukraine of being defeated in this way and of losing all of these territories is incalculable and is something that needs to be, I, I would say, would need to be talked about. Anyway, this is where I think Timofeya from this point on begins to go wrong because he then says that the military conflict would be unlikely to culminate in any intelligible agreement. A victory over the armed forces of Ukraine would not by itself lead to a fast peace. The war could develop into a long and sluggish confrontation, especially if part of the territory remains under the control of the Ukrainian armed forces. Well, to be straightforward, I think the Russians, if that was what were to happen, could live with that. A very weakened uh, Ukraine, one which would be economically unviable, would not, I think, be a disaster for Russia. It would be a disaster for Ukraine. I'm not convinced, as I said, that that's the Russian plan. But, you know, I'm not sure that the Russians would be looking for an agreement. After all, after they uh, defeated Georgia in 2008, they imposed, in effect, an outcome. And they're perfectly content thereafter to let the situation uh, continue as is. And if you like, to wait, to wait it out. Then... Um, um, Timofeyev talks about how Russia would be in diplomatic isolation, but that would, to my mind, only happen if there were a situation where the Russians had launched an aggressive war. And I'm going to come back to that um, fairly soon. And then he discusses popular reaction to this. And he says that controlling Ukraine, even its, in its eastern part, could be po problematic. Taking into account the Western sanctions blockade, any transactions within with the territories of Ukraine under Russian control would be impossible. I'm not sure why, but anyway, <laughs> Russia would have to take on a huge territory. The big question is whether the Russian market in the grip of new sanctions, we'll come to a discussion of the sanctions in a short time, would be able to compensate 
for the damage to the to the Ukrainian territories under Russian control. The loyalty of the population of eastern Ukraine to Russia is not obvious, despite all the internal disagreements. Over the past 30 years, Ukraine has developed its own civic identity. The population of the eastern regions may have a negative attitude towards excessive nationalism. However, that does not guarantee their loyalty to Russia. The war could finally undermine sympathy for Russia, which had already dwindled over the past six years. And he also then speaks about how a victory in Ukraine, a, a Russian victory in over Ukraine, would also consolidate anti-Russian sentiment within what was left of Ukraine itself. Now, I'm going to say straight away that I think that these are problematic speculations. And it needs to be stressed that they are speculations. Personally, judging from the information I'm getting from eastern Ukraine, I think that if the Russians were to take over eastern Ukraine, places like Kharkiv, Odessa, those sort of places, they would run into very little resistance from the population indeed. I think that there would actually not be this massive amount of disloyalty that Timofeyev imagines. If Ukraine had been an economic success story since it gained independence in 1991, if Ukrainian living standards were much higher than they are, then it might be different. Then it might be that people in places like Odessa and Kharkiv and Nikolaev and Kherson and all the rest, that they might actually resent absorption by Russia. But the reality, of course, is far otherwise. Ukraine is either Europe's poorest country or its second poorest country. There is a great deal of alienation and antagonism in all of these regions for, uh, towards the government. In Kiev, I've discussed in a recent program how I think the claims that some people are making, including Timofeyev and Levin, by the way, in these articles, that there is an anti-Russian drift in Ukraine, simply doesn't actually correspond to the realities. I think that the Russians would have little difficulty in consolidating control over these territories. And I would add, moreover, that if that were to happen, then I can't for the life of me see why the Russians wouldn't be able to carry out transactions in eastern Ukraine. I think, again, Timofeyev is unable to see past certain um, effects of the um, Western sanctions in the past. Western sanctions have uh, attempted to cut off Crimea, even from the Russian financial system, and they have been ineffectual there. And I'm sure the same would be true with eastern Ukraine as well. Now, what about western Ukraine? What about the rest of Ukraine? Would anti-Russian sentiment in this part of Ukraine persist? Well, it might do. It might get stronger. It might be that people in western Ukraine and in central Ukraine, in places like Kiev, feel enormously bitter and very angry about the way in which um, the Russians would have launched won this war against them, taken even more territory from Ukraine. There might be bitter anger towards Russia there. But, of course, there is another possible uh, uh, forecast. I mean, I'm not speculation, which is that for Ukraine itself, a defeat of this kind by Russia, an overwhelming defeat of this nature, would be a massively disillusioning experience. The Ukrainians would have gone to war with Russia. They would have been comprehensively defeated, despite all the claims about how much more powerful the Ukrainian armed forces have become. And in that kind of situation, the Ukrainians would also surely feel 
bitterly let down by the West. And given how let down by the West they would be, I think it's a toss-up whether their anger towards Russia or their disillusion towards the West would be greater. And given the intense nature of that disillusion with the West, it's not difficult to see how some people in Ukraine might start to say to themselves, well, what have we achieved as a result of all our attempts to distance ourselves from Russia? We've lost vast territories. We're now reduced to a rump state. We are economically unviable. We are cut off from the sea. Western support amounts to nothing. Perhaps the right thing to do, perhaps the only thing we can do, finally, is to accept that we've got to do that deal with the Russians, especially if the Russians continue to say that they're prepared to deal with us. So I don't think that this assumption that a war in Ukraine would consolidate anti-Russian feeling in Ukraine is not necessarily true. I come back to my original point. It would depend very much on who started that war. If Russia launched an aggression, well, then I accept that at that point, feeling against Russia in Ukraine would probably be extremely strong and it would prevail over disillusion with the West. But if Ukraine started that war, I could see how there might quite easily be a revulsion of feeling in Ukraine or what was left of Ukraine, at least in central Ukraine, the area around Kiev, the area that used to be part of the Tsarist Empire and of the Soviet Union before 1939. I can easily see how sentiment there might turn against the entire course of confrontation with Russia, which had brought the brought Ukraine to disaster, as well as massive disillusionment with the West, which would have been seen to have failed to fulfil its promises. Now, I come back to my original point. Since Ukraine, since there is no possibility that Russia would start a war, since it would be Ukraine that would, st that would have started it, I can't help but think that it is the second scenario that is the more plausible one. Anyway, to proceed, because here, of course, um, Levin has his own things to say, and he actually does something which Timofeyev doesn't. He doesn't take up the other major issue of what the effect on the West of a defeat in Ukraine would be. And it's important to stress that before we talk about sanctions and diplomatic responses or anything of that nature, the effect of a defeat in Ukraine for the West would be cataclysmic. There would be a massive crash in US credibility. There would be a crisis of confidence in NATO and in US resolve across Eastern Europe. And it's difficult to know exactly how that would work out. But Levin, unlike Timofeyev, takes that on. And he discusses what the US reaction to a war which might result in a debacle in eastern Ukraine might be. And he, he writes as follows. As for the United States and NATO, most probably they would not intervene as they failed to intervene to help Ukraine in 2014 and to help Georgia in 2008, despite much talk of American commitments to these countries. If after all the Western rhetoric about support for Ukraine, the United States and NATO stand by and do nothing while Ukraine is crushed, the damage to US credibility will be very grave. That's an understatement. And will be seriously noticed in Beijing. It could possibly be, therefore, that some reckless hawks 
in the United States establishment might in fact engineer some form of military intervention in Ukraine. Well, there might be some talk of that, but then of course Levin explains why that would be utter madness and why it would realistically not happen. If it were to occur, the results would be catastrophic. Quite apart from the risk of nuclear war, Russian forces colossally outnumber not just the Ukrainians, but any forces that the United States and NATO could or would deploy quickly in Ukraine and would therefore win a ground war with NATO. The United States has only three combat brigades based in Europe and only one of them is armoured, far too few to fight Russia. It does have more than 200 combat aircraft, but these would initially at least be severely outnumbered. That doesn't, by the way, take into account the enormously powerful and potent uh, Russian land-based air defence system, their enormously sophisticated surface-to-air missile systems, the S-400, the S-300, the S-350, the S-5 hundred, the S-550, all of those which are now coming into service and which must be added to any uh, um, calculation of aerial balance. If America was seriously planning to fight Russia, it would need vastly to increase this, these forces with everything that would mean for increases in the US military budget at the expense of domestic needs and the national debt and for a weakening of the US position vis-à-vis -vis China. On paper, America's European NATO allies have hundreds of thousands of combat troops. Levin puts the word combat troops in inverted commas. But does anyone seriously think that their governments would send them to fight in Ukraine or that European publics would allow them to do so? Britain might loyally turn up as usual, but due to recurrent cuts, the entire British army is now capable of fielding just two combat brigades and only one of these immediately. Rather than repelling a Russian offensive, the United States would therefore be faced with the prospect of planning a great and horribly bloody war to recover lost Ukrainian territory this would also risk becoming a world war, for it is virtually certain that China would exploit a war between the United States and Russia, thereby threatening the United States with the risk of two wars simultaneously and defeat in both. I will come back to that briefly. So, realistically, when one looks at it in this way, the military option simply isn't there. You can move troops and ships around Russia's borders. You could signal all sorts of things. But in practical terms, the option of a military intervention in Ukraine has no reality behind it. Everybody knows it. The Russians know it. The Americans know it. The Europeans know it. The NATO leadership know it. It is a bluff. And it is a bluff which, if there is a war, would be immediately and comprehensively called. There is no way that the United States can move the vast numbers of troops to defeat the Russians in Ukraine that people are, are speculating about. And as for Britain sending a combat brigade to Ukraine, not only would that be a tiny force relative to this vast struggle of hundreds of thousands that we are talking about. But it reminds me, to be truthful, of a famous tag by the German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, who when in the 19th century, during one of Prussia's various wars, were asked what he would do if the British were to land a force in Prussian Pomerania. He said he would send the police to round them up and arrest them. One's almost tempted to say that such a lightweight force sent to Ukraine by Britain would achieve nothing. And even for that reason, I doubt that even the Johnson government would send them. So this military scenario, 
simply doesn't exist. It's so unrealistic that Timofeyev doesn't discuss it. And Levin points out its fundamental impossibilities and ultimate follies. So, if a military option isn't real, if it isn't available, what have we left? Well, this is where we come back to Timofeyev, and he talks about sanctions. And realistically, that's all the trick that is left now in the Western toolkit. This is all that they could do. And this is what Timofeyev has to say. All key Western players would introduce qualitatively new sanctions and restrictions are against Russia. These would harm a number of Western countries and cause temporary shocks in world markets. But in an emergency situation, the West would take such measures despite the economic cost. Possible measures include blocking sanctions against all Russian banks, including the Bank of Russia. This would largely cut, off, cut Russia off from the global financial system. Another pos possible measure is a ban on the purchase of Russian oil and gas. Such bans can be increased gradually in order to avoid crisis situations with fuel supplies in the West itself. But in the event of a war in Ukraine, the West would take these measures. Other more focused restrictions would be applied to imports and exports of oil and gas. The cumulative damage to the Russian economy would be colossal in scale. But you can almost see how Timofeyev is trying to convince himself here. Because realistically, we are, in terms of sanctions, essentially maxed out. We've now reached that stage where any further sanctions which the West imposes on Russia are going to have blowback on Western economies. Now, let's take them step by step. First of all, Timofeyev talks about a situation where um, there would be blocking sanctions against all Russian banks. I'm not sure whether Timofeyev is aware of the fact, but this is essentially what happened in 2014. Back in 2014, the um, West imposed restrictions on certain Russian state banks. Restrictions, by the way, which were significantly tightened after a few months. In practice, that meant that the entire Russian banking system was effectively cut off from Western financing. Not just the Russian banking system, but practically the entire Russian economy. Well, the Russian economy adjusted and survived. And it did so despite the fact that in 2014, Russia didn't have much of a financial system to speak of because the banks and financial institutions that operated within the Russian economy, including Russian banks, were essentially part of the global financial system at that time. Today, things are radically different. Russian banks have learned to operate and function independently within the Russian market. The state banks were able to do that quite easily because, of course, they had the backing of the Russian state behind them. Gradually, Russian banks have adjusted to that reality also. Obviously, there would be a cutoff from the swift interbank inter messaging and trading system. But to a great extent, the Russians have prepared for that possibility also. Russian companies would no longer be able to float bonds and to borrow in Western financial markets. But for several years after 2014, they weren't able to either. They can to a limited extent today. But again, they would rapidly adjust to that kind of situation. And there is more than enough sufficient funding within Russia to make that possible. Of course, you could try to cut off the Russian Central Bank, the Bank of Russia. But again, 
I'm not sure how important relative to the situation within Russia itself doing that would be. And then we come to the other objective, what, what is being spoken about here. Cutting off Russian oil and gas. Now, we're in a situation in Europe at the moment where there is not enough Russian gas. And we're seeing the enormous pressure that is causing on the European economy. We're also seeing that the United States is increasingly importing ever larger quantities of Russian oil and liquefied natural gas. The idea that you can just cut off all Russian oil and gas from the global market is ludicrous. Even trying to do it in the kind of cumulative way that Timofeyev is talk talking about is completely unrealistic. Markets would go simply berserk. Oil and gas prices would skyrocket and it would be Western economies which would be severely hit and which would suffer. In addition, Russia is now becoming a major food exporter. If you started to take those sort of steps against Russian oil and gas exports, um, markets might say, well, the same sort of restrictions would be imposed on Russian food exports or Russian exports of liquefied nitrogen, which go to provide uh, the West with much of the chemical fertilizer that is used um, in the world, uh, uh, the world food industry, and food prices would rocket. In a situation of worldwide inflation, would the West really want to see that? Just a few years ago, when the United States imposed sanctions on Russia's leading aluminium producer, Rusal, what they saw was a skyrocketing of world aluminium prices, which had an immediate impact on the US motor vehicle and air aerospace industries. Would the United States really want to get into a situation where it imposed those sort of sanctions during the kind of damage on its economy that um, sanctions of this kind would result in? Well, possibly. But again, I have to say that there would be a very heavy economic and political price. And I can't help but wonder whether many Western business people caught in this sort of trap after the long years of effective recession we've experienced since the 2008 financial crisis and with all the pandemic problems on top, whether they would say enough is enough. We've put up with all of this for long enough. Ukraine isn't worth the price and whether you started to see pressure, cumulative pressure to relax the sanctions from that point on. I can remember Barack Obama saying back in 2016, when sectoral sanctions were first imposed upon Russia, uh, following the events that took place in Ukraine that year, that the sanctions that the United States had imposed had been carefully calibrated to do the maximum damage on Russia without impacting on the world economy. Well, it seems to me that escalating the sanctions war even further could easily backfire. It might not have the effect on the Russian economy that some people imagine, but it might actually do real and very significant damage to the Western economies, much greater damage than Timofeyev seems to realise. And then, of course, there's the other thing, the, 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 the uncertain, the joker in the pack, if you like, in this kind of situation. And that is the response of Russia's now increasingly important major trading partner, which is China. In 2014, all of Russia's trade, all its oil, all its gas exports um, went 
westward to Europe. And Russian companies looked to Europe for their financing. They now obviously look increasingly to their own domestic market for their financing. But realistically, if you're going to cut off Russia, uh, if you're going to try and isolate it economically, you can only do that if the Chinese are on side with you. If they're not, if the Chinese continue to trade with the Russians, then, of course, your sanctions, the effect of your sanctions, becomes much reduced. And would the Chinese, in effect, agree to isolate Russia in this kind of situation? Well, this is now where we come now to the whole business of red lines, because it's been striking how both the Chinese and the Russians um, over the last uh, few months have both simultaneously started talking to uh, uh, publicly about the fact that they have red lines. The Chinese have spoken about their red lines with respect to Taiwan. The Russians have been speaking about their red lines with respect to Belarus and Ukraine. And it's impossible to think that this has happened, given the extent of the cooperation that now exists between these two countries. Just yesterday, I did a program about how Russia's and China's ambassadors are simultaneously publish, publishing joint statements that they have agreed with each other. It's impossible, to my way of thinking, that this decision by both China and Russia to simultaneously discuss red lines has not been coordinated the, between the two. So, since neither side wants to give the other a blank check, they will have come along and they will have said, um, well, we will support you, provided you do this. In other words, if you respond to a crossing of red lines, we won't support you if you take any aggressive action. But if uh, your red lines are crossed, well, you can rely on our support. And I'm pretty sure that this is what's happened. And I'm pretty sure that it's been game planned. I'm pretty sure, for example, that if there is a Ukrainian attack on eastern Ukraine, the Russians have already spoken to the Chinese and they've explained to the Chinese very carefully how they would respond, how Russia would respond to such an attack and that the Russians have already discussed with the Chinese what... Uh, measures would need to be taken and the Chinese would have talked to the Russians and would have signaled to the Russians the kind of steps that China would take in response in order to uh, support Russia in that kind of contingency. And the same surely applies to Taiwan. If the Chinese were out of the blue to launch an aggressive attack on Taiwan, well, the Russians would probably say, well, that isn't something which we can support. But if China's red lines are crossed, if Taiwan declares independence and China has to react militarily, well, again, at that point, I am sure that there's an agreement reached that there would be support from Russia. And in a kind of situation where Ukraine attacks Donbass, and Taiwan uh, declares independence, well, in those sort of situations, it's not difficult to see that what would happen is that each, co each country would act to mitigate the sanctions pressure on the other. And in fact, exactly as I am speaking this, there's been a statement by the Russian Prime Minister, Mr Mishutsin, who makes precisely that point. And you can find it on the Russian news agency, TASS. And it says that um, Russia, China are teaming up response, best response to a legitimate sanctions. And this is said by Mikhail Mishutsin, who pointed out to the pointed to the intertwining of plans between the Eurasian Economic Union and the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. So there it is. We can see 
that the Chinese and the Russians, in terms of e sanctions pressure, would support each other. If China were pushed into a position where it had to take military action against Taiwan, and the United States were to retaliate by imposing an economic blockade on China, well, the Russians would continue to provide China with food, raw materials, oil and gas. The pipelines are being built. The tankers are being prepared. The grain shipments are there so that the effect of that blockade would be mitigated. And conversely, if the Americans and the Europeans were to impose sanctions on Russia following a Ukrainian attack on Donbass, which the Russians responded to, well, the Chinese market, the vast Chinese market, will remain open to Russian goods. The Chinese will continue to buy Russian oil and gas, and they would simply tell the Americans and the Europeans, well, this is your problem, it's not ours, we support Russia diplomatically and economically in this situation, and that sanctions that you might apply, well, they just don't concern us. So at that point, we would see the effect of those sanctions greatly mitigated. The United States does try to enforce sanctions through what it calls secondary sanctions by extending its sanctions to, let us say, Chinese companies which trade with Russia in that kind of situation. But it's difficult to see how those secondary sanctions could be made effective in this kind of situation without the United States ending up having to sanction the entire Chinese economy, given the extent of the mutual trade between Russia and China. And doing that, of course, would have massive repercussions on the global economy, including that of the United States. So whilst I'm not saying that economic sanctions would not be a severe problem, they would not be the crisis for Russia, which I think Timofeyev imagines that they might be. Now, to be very clear, I'm not, I want to stress again, I don't think the Russians are looking for a war in Ukraine. I don't think the Chinese are looking for a war in Taiwan. One of the reasons they're not looking for wars in either places is because they feel that time is on their side in both places. Both countries are still at a relatively early stage in their economic integration processes, and both sides are still at a fairly early stage in their respective military build-ups. From their point of view, if there is going to be a military clash, either in Ukraine or in Taiwan, well, then it would be better if it happened in, say, five years' time, as opposed to now. So I think that, for the moment, neither side is particularly, neither the Chinese nor the Russians are looking for a fight. And besides, in, certainly in terms of Russia, I don't think that this is something that Russian society would be looking for at any time. But I think it would be a grave mistake to think that the Russians and the Chinese would not respond if they were pushed. And with respect to Ukraine, I think the Russians have made it fairly clear that they would respond. I don't see any good outcome for the West in this sort of crisis. And here I end with the point that um, Anatole Levin is making. And he makes the entirely valid point that the crisis that is now brewing in Ukraine could have no conceivable good outcome. And it would be, in, the, in light of this, a disaster that the West should do everything it possibly can can do to avoid. And it says it is still entirely possible 
to avoid this outcome. A reasonable basis for a solution to the Donbass dispute has existed since 2015 in the form of the Minsk II Protocol. Full autonomy for the Donbass within Ukraine, under Ukrainian sovereignty, but without Ukrainian troops. And then he talks about a presence of a United Nations peacekeeping force. That is out of the question, by the way. And then he goes on to speak about cultural and linguistic protections for Russians in Ukraine. These should be supported by the West as a matter of basic principle. And then he talks about the Austrian State Treaty of 1955, which led to the withdrawal of Western and U West, uh, uh, Soviet and Western forces from Austria in return for Austrian neutrality. And he suggested that this could be a possible format for uh, um, Ukrainian neutrality also. And then he goes on, I mean, he, he makes all sorts of other suggestions, some of which are, I would say, completely unrealistic. But then he goes on to say these compromises would be very painful for Washington and would require considerable moral courage. The possession of moral courage linked to true patriotism is the most important element in the difference between a statesman and a mere politician. The experience of the past generation suggests that the contemporary West is incapable of producing statesmen. President Biden now has the chance to prove that impression wrong. Well, I agree with Levin on as in most of what he says. He makes some points here, which I say straight away, I don't agree with. He talks about getting the Russians to recognise Kosovo. I don't think there's any chance of that. Why would they, in fact? And and things of that uh, and things of this sort. But regardless, it is possible to turn this round. It is possible to find a solution. All the facts show that the outcome for the West from, from a confrontation in Ukraine would be bad. Statesmanship points to a need for compromise. A compromise which, to be clear, would be basically on Russian terms. Will the West take it? No sign of it. And that's what makes me feel that the situation in Ukraine is getting graver by the month and by the day. But when we look at this issue, when we look at what people like Timofeyev and Levin have to say, and I stress again, these are people who do not want to see a war in Ukraine. Even someone like Timofeyev, who doesn't want to see a war in Ukraine because he thinks the outcome for Russia would be bad, has difficulty explaining quite why it would be the catastrophe that he says, given the changed economic and geopolitical realities, and how, in both cases, Timofeyev and Levin chart a course which, in the event that the Ukrainian crisis were to erupt in that way, would be disastrous for the West. Well, statesmanship in the West, in short supply, as Levin says, we will see if, bar statesmanship, we get some glimmers of reality instead. Time will tell. Thank you for joining me for this programme today. I look forward to you joining me again soon in future programmes, both on this channel and on our main channel, The Duran. And also, I would ask you to uh, uh, check out Alex's channel, Alex Christophorou's channel. You find links under this video. You can also join us on our main, on our new platform, Locals, where we are busy. We have um, a an active membership there. We're publishing increasing amounts of exclusive content. I'm providing content now regularly, exclusive content regularly on Locals, and I now have a regular live stream there every Wednesday. And um, you can also join us on other platforms, BitChute, Library, Rumble, Odyssey, SuperU, and all the rest.
and you can support us for our Patreon and subscribe star. You can buy, come to our shop and buy the amazing things that you will find there. Our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts and all the rest. And if you like this video, please remember to press the like button and please also check your subscription to this channel. Thank you for joining me again today. I look forward to you joining me again soon and have a wonderful day until then.